when I, when I told Don Forrester, who's one of the doctors who works for our program, that I had Rupert Reed on, he says, you gotta be kidding. This guy is so amazing. How'd you get him? Well, he's a, he's a, a, a very progressive guy to say the least. As a matter of fact, he's, he, he's out there breaking down walls. He's been uh, involved with the Green Party. He's also involved in, uh, in environmental extinction groups. And this is a man who really speaks his mind. He has a very clear message uh, and somewhat optimistic. But at the end of his presentation, I'm going to see if I can drag as much optimism out of him as possible. So let, let's go ahead and uh, hear about, excuse me, Rupert Reed. It's Rupert Reed. What did I say, Richard? Rupert Reed. And uh, let's uh, hear what he has to say. The climate emergency that grips our world is different from other emergencies. Firstly, it's long. It's not something that just comes and goes. It's going to be with us basically permanently across all of our lives. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Secondly, it's a subset of a much broader and even more complex emergency, the ecological emergency. Climate is the symptom of a much deeper ailment. These emergencies are the defining problem of our times. They're sometimes called a wicked problem. Even that I think understates the issue. The very word problem may be problematic here. These emergencies are a tragedy. They come from tragic flaws in our system, possibly in our very selves, in our very being. They are a condition which is going to define us and the whole rest of our lives and the lives of our children. They are defining in that the only question that our children will really care about, the only question that they will ask us searchingly with utmost seriousness is, what did you do while there was still time to do something meaningful about this? These emergencies are defining of us. Furthermore, they are profoundly complex. There is no silver bullet to deal with these emergencies. In fact, there are very few bullets at all. I've come to the conclusion slowly and painfully over recent years that there is no bullet that in our situation, in this emergency, can save our civilization. What do I mean by that dramatic pronouncement? Three possibilities confront us. First possibility, that our civilization will be terminated with extreme prejudice, and that that will be it for us. This possibility can no longer be ruled out. It is possible. Second possibility, that our civilization will collapse, but a new civilization will emerge from the ashes. This is what I call the Phoenix scenario. Third and final possibility, that our civilization will transform. This is what I call the butterfly scenario. But please notice this, if our civilization does transform, it will be as different as a butterfly is from a caterpillar once it's transformed. Right now, our civilization is alarmingly like a caterpillar. It chomps through everything rapidly, without thought, converting it to waste. But our civilization could become a butterfly we could live far more lightly on the earth. We could make our way of being far more beautiful. We could commit senseful acts of beauty. That could be our life. So three possibilities, but notice, whichever one of them comes to fruition, this civilization is finished. Because even if we achieve the third possibility, the butterfly scenario, what emerges will be so different from what we have that in no meaningful sense will it deserve to be called the same civilization. It will be as different as a butterfly is from a caterpillar or for that matter, from a pupa. When I talk about this, I notice that everybody loves the butterfly possibility, option three, and understandably so, obviously so. 
But I have to tell you this, we've left it so late. We have so little time. What we really needed was governments that were genuinely green in power 30, 40 years ago, after the early warnings of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s. But that didn't happen. It's not five minutes to midnight. It's five minutes past midnight. We've left it so late that the butterfly scenario, while I still strongly believe that it is achievable, cannot be adjudged to be likely to be achieved. Option two, scenario two, the Phoenix scenario is much more likely and will involve much more suffering. So we need to aim for the butterfly scenario, but we need to be ready for collapse and for seeking to seed the Phoenix scenario, the Phoenix civilization that will then potentially, hopefully follow. What does this mean? Well, it means that we need to do everything. We need to transform everything. We need to do so in a way which is aiming at transformation without collapse, but is also ready to cope with collapse. We need to work at transforming, therefore, on multiple dimensions and multiple levels and in every meaningful way possible, while focusing our effort on those actions with the potentially highest rewards. So what are the implications of this? Any one dimensional approach to the emergency is wrong. Any approach that imagines holding onto the current paradigm is doomed. Any approach that does not prepare for failure as well as for success is inadequate. Okay, so taking those parameters as given now, for the sake of argument at least, what does this imply in terms of the absolutely crucial area, central obviously to our very existence, of diet and food? As an aside, let me just remark that it is a powerful indictment of contemporary economics, that economists in societies like the US and the UK say things like, well, agriculture is only one, two, three percent of GDP. It's not that important. In the words of uh, someone wise from long ago, one day these people will learn, you cannot eat money. Obviously, we need to eat lower on the food chain. But I want to note the following couple of points. Firstly, this is not a silver bullet. And secondly, it's not even necessarily the main way in which we want to look at the problem of diet and food in relation to climate and ecology. Remember, this civilization is finished. It has a sell-by date. It certainly has a best before date. The paradigm is dead. What this really means is the coming end of industrial growth society. Most people are still assuming there will be more industrialization in the future, more technology. And indeed, of course, some technologies are going to be part of what we need in years to come, very notably renewable energy technology. But if the current paradigm is dead, as I've argued, actually there's gonna be less industry on balance in future. There's gonna be less technology. There's gonna be less dependence on technology. If this is not so, we will just push ourselves further off the cliff that we are already hanging off the edge of. So according to this analysis, the key problem we face is not animal agriculture. It is industrial agriculture. That is what cannot be sustained. That is what depends on fossil inputs, which will no longer be available in the future. That is what is contributing to the destruction of our way of life. Now there is a large overlap between animal agriculture and, in, and industrial agriculture, but it is not a complete overlap. Obviously factory farms have to go, obviously feedlots have to go, but there may be forms of animal agriculture which should survive the end, the necessary and coming end of industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture is going to come to an end. It will either come to an end through intelligent voluntary action on our part, 
to transform everything, or it will come to an end through collapse. The future will involve less industrial agriculture. The future will be more local. It just depends how we get to that final state. So let me suggest to you a few examples of how elements of animal agriculture may survive the end of industrial agriculture and how this may not be a bad thing. First example, care is needed not to dismiss the lifestyle and potential contribution of pastoralists, people who live essentially dependent upon livestock. Let me give you an instance in my own experience. I was in the Carpathian Alps in Romania a few years ago. This is one of the relatively few parts of Europe which has not been destroyed by industrial agriculture, which by the way has been um, very badly, i.e. strongly funded by the European Union. The European Union has a heavy responsibility for the ending of traditional less harmful forms of agriculture across Europe. But in parts of Romania, traditional forms of agriculture still survive, including mob grazing, including that is large herds, for example, which I saw of sheep, which are guarded by shepherds with dogs. Yes, shepherds still exist. And in this part of Romania, the Carpathian Alps, the wildlife that is present there is absolutely extraordinarily rich. The ecosystems are far more intact and biodiverse than virtually anywhere else in Europe. I saw bears, there are wolves there, but not only that, the thing which really struck me was the huge number of insects, flocks as it were of butterflies. I don't know what the correct, what the correct collective noun is for large numbers of butterflies. I've never seen such numbers of butterflies in the UK. We just don't have that uh, anymore in most of the UK, virtually all of the UK, but they do have it in, in Romania. And I'm convinced that part of the reason why is that agriculture there is still fairly traditional, uses relatively few industrial inputs. And some of that agriculture is pastoralism. Ditto fisher folk, not the industrial fleets. They have to come to an end, obviously, but care is needed not to simply rule out a priori the reliance that many people have on small scale fishing. Another example, it's very crude to assimilate backyard chickens, which may have a role to play in small scale agriculture in the using up of waste around the house and around the small holding or, or farm, etc. Very crude to lump those in with battery hens. Factory farming of chickens, etc., obviously has to end, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all agriculture involving poultry has to end. And final example, obviously lots of rewilding is needed and lots is possible. If many of us go vegan or freegan, or at the very least vegetarian or flexitarian, but should this newly rewilded land be left pure, wild. Remember that there's little for humans to gather and forage in many, not all, in many wild environments, but in most there is flesh available. I want to put to you a radical notion which some of you may be uncomfortable with. It's paradoxical, but it seems to me it actually makes sense. Imagine a future in which most of us are exclusively vegan or mainly vegan, combined with eating some wild meat. Notice that this will be a better guarantor against hunger than veganism alone, which leaves out, veganism leaves out this potential source of protein. Put it another way, veganism alone leaves us a little more vulnerable to potential hunger in the future, unless of course you're willing to dip in to the stores of wild protein in extremis. The years ahead, may well be years of climate driven food shortage. That actually is my fear that the most likely way that our society and societies like it collapse is through food shortages driven by ecological deterioration, driven partly, not exclusively probably, by climate decline. In this context, in this scary context, our food system should be more secure, more sovereign, more local, 
It should be more diverse. It should have redundancy built in, a good margin of excess calories, etc. Industrial veganism with processed food, etc., at its heart. No, that is not going to be the future. A system that is mainly vegan, based on fresh food from small family farms, small holdings, community supported agriculture, etc., with probably an added margin of pastoralism or hunting in rewilded lands, that may be our best bet. As I have argued, everything is going to be transformed within our lifetimes. It will either be transformed voluntarily or by force of enraged nature. The ecological crisis in its vast complexity is the issue. It is the issue on which we will be judged by future generations. And if we don't get it right, we will be judged. Industrialism, our current system, with its profligacy, its uber complexity, its long supply lines, its dangerously long supply lines. Industrialism is the problem. Aiming at economic growth is the problem. Industrial agriculture is by definition animal unfriendly. It replaces natural habitats with artificial habitats. It is an endless holocaust against rodents, against insects, and thus against birds. You want to think the future according to industrial agriculture? Imagine a combine harvester stamping on the face of a mouse forever. And this applies whether the food that has been grown is being eaten by vegans or by meat eaters. It's just that meat eating does it at a far worse scale and with far worse intensity. But any industrial agriculture is a systematic crime against animals. It is not, it cannot be animal friendly. Of course, I use the word forever, it will not be forever. This is gonna to come to an end. The only question is, do we bring it to an end voluntarily and intelligently, or is the end imposed upon us by force? The latter, sadly, is much more likely. We must bring about the former as much as possible. And we must do so, I have suggested, in a way that is relatively open-minded. We need an ecological, broad spectrum, collective response to this mother of all crises that faces us. The response cannot be limited to individual or private lifestyle changes. It needs to be broadly political. It needs to center on system change. It needs to revolutionize our food system. But I would suggest in the kind of deep, wide, complex and pragmatic, realistic way I've outlined. Let's build a future that is based primarily in mass veganism. But let's, let's not rule out elements to such a system that are open to the eating by some of some animal flesh as part of a largely local, small-scaled, diverse ecosystem, as we might put it, of agroecological sanity. That is our best bet, I've argued, for heading off collapse. And our best bet for eking an existence out through such collapse, if that is what befalls us, as is tragically, increasingly likely. A transformed future beckons. It's incredibly exciting, as well as pretty terrifying. Let's create it swiftly, undogmatically, wisely. Thank you. I look forward to discussing these matters with you. Nice, nice to meet a kindred spirit, somebody who understands uh, that we really have to take some big steps. Could you, could you explain to me um, uh, what you think the world can look like? Uh, what, what is the best possible scenario? Because mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. Uh, I, I really got concerned about the environment 16 years ago when Heather's first uh, child was born, my first grandson. My whole focus changed from uh, an interest in medicine to an interest in, you know, what can I do? Even if it's just a tiny part, what can I do to help people? I realized that we knew a, a good diet and, and I had to become optimistic and it didn't happen for a long time, but I, I guess maybe I put some blinders on to try and realize our current situation. And I've, 
I wanted to see an optimistic point of view. Uh, is there one that you have? Yeah, so um, I gave you my, uh, my three scenarios in the, in the talk. Um, uh, the first of termination, or as I sometimes call it, with a, a little bit of a, a wry smile, though it's not really a laughing matter, the dodo scenario. Um, second, the, uh, the phoenix scenario. And third, the butterfly scenario. And as I say, obviously, what we need to do is, uh, is aim for the butterfly scenario. Uh, the point I made is that, I, unfortunately, I don't think we can count on achieving that scenario anymore. So we have to be ready for the, the phoenix scenario. We have, well, we should aim for butterfly. What does butterfly mean? What would it look like? That's really what your question is, John. Yeah, like so what I think it would look like is, well, not a lot like what we have. Um, we would have a world which is far more um, local. It would be radically relocalized. That relocalization, by the way, may have been started by COVID-19. Uh, COVID, we may have already seen peak globalization. We may never have as much air travel again uh, as we had uh, in 2019. Uh, and that's uh, obviously to be hoped for because that's the kind of change that we need um, if we're going to uh, survive, uh, let alone prosper uh, as a species. So the future will be far more local. Food, uh, food miles in particular will be way, way down. Um, and what we need to be thinking of is, uh, is a, a, lo a relocalized future that is a, a small farm uh, future primarily. We need to reduce scale at uh, virtually all levels of our economy and society. If we're gonna have a, um, a resilient, uh, less monocultural um, society, and that's the kind of society that could survive. That's the kind of society that could uh, not uh, collapse. Um, I envisage uh, our future, if we manage to achieve this butterfly scenario as one in which we have energy descended a great deal, i.e. we use a lot less energy than we do at present. And of course, the energy that we do use would come primarily from genuinely renewable uh, sources, uh, especially the sun, but also other renewable uh, uh, sources. Um, and well, you know, uh, it really could be a, a wonderful world. Um, it could be a world uh, in which, for example, um, people um, have much more control and power over their lives. One of the reasons why there's been the rise in uh, unpleasant far-right populism in recent years is people have felt out of control of their lives and they wanted to take back uh, control. Well, a radically relocalized future that is energy descended, that rebuilds community where people are actually in control a lot more of the, the food that they eat of the communities that they live in. Um, that's, a, that's a future which would actually head off that kind of risk of, uh, of hard right populism uh, if it's done right. So that is my hope. That is what I think. That's the kind of thing that I think we ought to, to aim for. Uh, a transformed uh, civilization in which we live in a way which has some of the benefits of um, the technologies that have become available recently to us, such as uh, renewable energy and hopefully we get to keep the internet uh, as well so we can carry on doing things like this once in a while. Um, but with far less uh, travel, uh, far less use of uh, energy, a far less uh, on balance uh, industry, uh, and a much more uh, resilient, uh, diverse, small scale, uh, relocalized uh, food system. Well, I have uh, two, two questions. Uh, you are uh, involved with the Green Party in the United Kingdom. What do you see in terms of politics? How, how are we going to have a government that Oh, and also an economic system. Do you see capitalism as the, the way to go? Is that going to survive or is it going to continue to destroy us? And the third part of this question is population. So government, economics, and population. Do you have any predictions on that or any thoughts? So there's three questions. Have you got about three hours? That's how long it will take me to answer them properly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll have a little go. Here. Yeah. Um, Look, the, the situation on the on the government front is uh, is pretty grim. Um, obviously, it's a it's great news that uh, that Trump lost and that uh, the the Democrats uh, have control in the Senate and so forth so forth in America. But it's all relative, right? I mean, Biden uh, is no uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, let alone um, a, a Gandhi or something like that, right? Um, what we're going to get in the states in the next few years. Um, is going to be better than the horrendous rubbish that we got in the last few years. Um, but it's not going to be enough. Um, and you, you all in the States, you need to um, get, get uh, organized now 
to put maximum pressure uh, on the Democrats to, to, to really deliver as much as they possibly can. Um, you can do that through the Sunrise Movement and Extinction Rebellion and so forth, as I'm sure you know, uh, and in other ways, of course. Um, you need to do that. You know, if, you th if you're thinking, well, Biden and the Democrats are going to take care of it, I mean, they're absolutely not. Um, they only look good compared to Trump, who is, you know, just one step away from Hitler. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a long road we've got to go on the front of government. And frankly, uh, am I optimistic? Not really. If, if the question is, will we do enough and will we do it in time? Um, this is partly why we have to be preparing ourselves for the possibility of, um, of collapse. And of course, the beauty of the transformed civilization that I sort of sketched a minute ago in answer to your first question is that that's also the kind of society that we need that will maximally insure us against um, the bad effects of a, a societal collapse, right? If people are growing most of their own food uh, locally, um, if people have uh, control over most of the things that they need in their lives within their local community and are organized in their community to exercise that control, then if central government starts to fall apart and long, long supply lines break down, we'll be able to survive that. Um, and that kind of takes us to the second question, right? The question of economy. So you ask specifically, will capitalism survive? Um, I don't know. Uh, and th there's lots that I don't know and lots that, that nobody knows. Um, what I do know though is this, if capitalism does survive the next generation, it will have to be transformed. It's the same point again, right? Um, either capitalism is going to do some kind of amazing butterfly jujitsu trick on itself, um, uh, or there's going to be a collapse. Um, so again, do I think it's likely that we're going to get that kind of transformation of capitalism? I don't think it's particularly likely. I think the, I think the vested interests that we face are enormous, absolutely enormous. You know, are the oil companies going to give up without a, a fight to just give one obvious uh, example? And I mean, you know, literally potentially a fight. Uh, if it comes to it. Um, so um, we need to be ready to, um, we need to ready ourselves for potential collapse. We need to try to reclaim uh, more power um, ourselves and start rebuild, start building, if you will, the alternative economy and society right now within the, the shell of what uh, exists uh, at the moment. Uh, and, and we need to get on with it. And finally, on the question of population, uh, well, it, it's obvious that, um, that the more uh, the human population um, uh, increases, uh, the more we, uh, we put ourselves at, at uh, mutual risk, the more we fragilize um, our systems. Uh, this is not um, intelligent. Um, so what does that imply? Well, uh, one thing that it implies is that um, if we're serious uh, about um, all of these problems, we need to find uh, wise, um, um, just ways of seeking to reduce our population. Um, so how do we do that? Well, the, the, the standard remedies are things like uh, making sure that uh, women are independent and are uh, educated, uh, making sure um, that there isn't um, social pressure um, to have more children. Um, we could uh, use for some uh, intelligent declarations from the Pope here, uh, and also from uh, leaders of other religions such as uh, Islam. Um, and, and things like that, um, you know, I don't think anyone wants to go down the kind of route that China went down. Um, but to those who say, oh, you can't talk about population reduction because that's, that's genocidal or that's nasty or that, that's racist or something, you know, that, that's just silly talk. Um, this, is, this is simply facts. I mean, if you care about having um, much of the world uh, uh, rewilded, if you care about the, the fact that we, we desperately need whether we're going to eat any of them or not, we desperately need there to be rich ecosystems with huge numbers of animals that are not just animals that we've grown uh, uh, to eat um, in our world. If you care about the fact that in my lifetime, more than half the world's wildlife has been wiped out, I mean, absolutely terrifying and appalling uh, statistic, then you have to care about controlling human population. Because if the human population keeps going up and up, well, where are the wild animals going to be? It's, it just doesn't add up. So no one who is serious about, um, about uh, wild nature and about wild animals uh, can be in favor of an endlessly growing human population. And I just want to mention the obvious. Uh, with the, the change in the temperature of the planet, you know, we've just seen the beginning of pandemics. And oh, yes. Viruses are going are to cross this earth 
and do a lot towards population. I, I know a lot of you would like this to be a, a sugar-coated, apolitical type of discussion, but unfortunately, politics uh, come into play and you know they have to come up. Uh, I, we can't say everybody's a good guy because they're not. Well, listen, uh, join us in about, uh, in about an hour and maybe an hour and a half and we'll get together and we'll open it up for questions and answers from the audience. And I'm sure they have a lot of questions. Definitely you had some things to say that were clear. Nobody wonders what, you, what your opinion is. You didn't hold anything back and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks, so, Joe. Thank Thanks you very much. Everybody.